Greetings once again, AP Calculus AP students. Mr. Record here, and we are going to be continuing our discussion over topic 1.6, which is all about determining limits using algebraic manipulations. Today's particular algebraic manipulation is going to be factoring. Now, if you tuned into our last video, you saw that the first four examples from my notes from topic 1.6 didn't require a whole lot of algebraic manipulation. We were very lucky that we could do what's called the green light, or at least that's what I call it. Our functions were so well behaved that you could simply replace the x with that targeted value c, and we were able to produce a nice numeric answer. Unfortunately, not all limits are going to be all about that green light. Sometimes you get stuck at a red light, and that's what I'm going to teach you how to do today, turning a green light from a red light. So here we go. So we're going to take a look at our first example here which is going to be example five. But before we do that, I want to allude to a description that often is attached to these kinds of limits. Functions that agree at all but one point. That may not make a lot of sense, but I, I hope that I can shed some light on that graphically here in just a moment. But if we read through this box, it just simply says that if you let C be a real number and, and let F of X equal G of X for all X that's not equal to C, in an open interval that can, contains c. We're saying that the limit of f of x as x approaches c and the limit of g of x as x approaches c have to be equal. Now I know that sounds like a lot of words, very confusing, but we're basically saying this. Hey, you got two functions that you think are the same? Well, why wouldn't their limits be equal? It only makes sense that they should be. But the issue with these two functions is that there might be one place where they're not quite the same but we're saying that that's still okay. We can still find the value of this limit as long as uh, uh, it does indeed exist. So if we take a look at example five, we have the limit as x approaches negative three of x squared plus x minus six over x plus three. Now, what we're gonna do in order to solve this limit is use some kind of a popular algebraic technique so that we can potentially eradicate this x plus three denominator. Let's face it, that x plus three denominator is causing a bit of a problem because if we replace the x's with negative three, you see we get nine minus three minus six, which of course is zero on top, and then we get the zero on bottom. Zero divided by zero is a very strange thing. It's not even a number. We should even write it down. What we know is some concept <coughs> that means that we really have to work a little bit harder in order to solve this limit. So what does working harder mean? Well, in this particular case, it means that we're going to factor this numerator. Now, I'm not going to turn this into a video that teaches you all how to factor. As a calculus student, you probably should have a pretty good mastery of factoring. But if you are a little rusty with it. There's a lot of videos out there you can check on YouTube that will bring you back up to speed. In this particular case, that six is going to be found by using three and negative two. And I want my positive one X in the middle and it looks like everything is good to go there. And I'm really happy that X plus three is a factor of the numerator because that is going to lead for to a cancellation. And in my particular class, I do ask that my students write out the final limit statement before they would evaluate. So in this case, this would be the limit of x minus two as x approaches negative three. And at this point, like we talked about in the last video, you can just replace the x with that negative three. In this case, we end up with negative five. Pretty simple. A couple of things I wanna point out though. I want you to really try to avoid doing things like this. If you say the limit as x approaches negative three equals negative five, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. If you look at this left side, it's like, what does that really mean? And a lot of times I'll tease my students to say, well, if you want to write this on your paper, then that might make me want to write this on my quizzes and tests. Find the square root. The square root of, you might ask. Well, I will say the same thing to you. What are you talking about? The limit of what? So you want to avoid this altogether. And I tell you what, another thing that you want to probably avoid, and I see this a little bit, but it's kind of a sign of weakness. 
if a student were to still write the limit statement there with their answer, it's indicating to me that you aren't real confident what the limit of a constant is. And in my opinion, this is not quite simplified and it would not earn full credit in my classroom. And so you wanna stay away from that. Basically, the rule of thumb is this. As soon as you evaluate your limit by plugging in this targeted value of x in for x, the limit statement disappears. It's used up, poof, it's gone. And then the only thing that you would end up writing is the answer, negative five in this case. Now I told you I would show something graphically about this problem that will kind of shed some light into this whole idea about functions that agree at all but one point. Let's take a look. So here we are with our TI Inspire software and I have gone ahead and sketched this function, this rational function that we had. And surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, it does sketch the graph of a line. I don't think it's too surprising, given the fact that when you have a squared x and you divide it by a first power x, the result would be a first power linear x, which should be a line. But the thing about this line that's a little interesting is the fact that when x is negative 3, we will not have a value on the function. We have an undefined place. Now, that doesn't mean that all hope is lost in finding the limit. Obviously, we just found that that limit is indeed negative 5, and you can see graphically that that certainly is the case. But if I were to go into my graph entry and insert x minus 2, if you recall, that was what this rational expression ultimately simplified to, you will see that it's essentially the same vertical line. Now, if you're wondering about this little open dot, just to show you, <laughs> This open dot is merely cosmetic. It's a feature in the TI Inspire that will allow me to move it around. So if I kind of move it completely off the picture here and go back and highlight my F5 function here in green, you'll see that that indeed is the same line without that open circle, and the limit is still going to equal negative 5. Functions that agree at all but that one point are still going to have that same limit. Let's take a look at our next example. Here we go, example six, just right up there is the limit as x approaches one of x cubed minus one over x minus one. Obviously, if we try to insert one for x, all bad things are gonna happen. We get the zero in the numerator, the zero in the denominator. It's just telling us we have to work a little harder. And so when we write this limit, x approaches one, we're gonna have to do some factoring again and the factoring that we do in this case might not be quite as comfortable with you because it might be a, a newer type of factoring that you may have learned in an Algebra 2 course, perhaps. But this is actually called the difference of two squares. And if you have a hard time factoring things like, or, sorry, the difference of two cubes, I almost <laughs> called this the wrong thing. These are perfect cubes, not perfect squares. And so if you have a hard time remembering what the factoring pattern for the difference of cubes, or the sum of cubes for that matter, I will have a video uh, link in the description here that will direct you to good friend Patrick JMT, who does a fantastic job of recapping those two factoring techniques. But in this case, since I have a subtraction here, the factoring is going to give me an x minus 1 in my first binomial, and then the formula goes a squared plus, always the opposite sign as your first, a times B, which in this case, the A is 1. I'm sorry, the A is X and the B is 1. Maybe I could denote that here. A is X, B is 1. So multiply those together. I have just X. And then the third sign here is always going to be a plus, no matter if it's the difference of cubes or the sum of cubes. And I'm going to take the B squared. Again, if that factoring is mind-blowing to you, you need to check out that video. It won't take very long, and you'll re be redirected and reminded on how to handle those kinds of factoring. Now, you can see that uh, we do have a pair of x minus 1s that will indeed cancel away, and that just means that we can write our little final limit statement before we invoke what I call the green light process. Letting the x take on the value of 1, you probably could do this in your head and get that answer of 3. Now, if you've paid attention and watched some of my earlier videos, back um, in topic 1.2, I believe, I actually introduced this idea, this function here, 
And we actually found its limit from a graphical standpoint, and we took a look at it from a numerical standpoint and a table of values. And so you could check out that and see that, yep, the answer was three back then. It better be three now. The only difference is that we didn't have to use a calculator or some kind of technology to find the answer. We could use our good friend, Factory. Now we still have a few other uh, algebraic techniques to focus on with our topic 1.6. So you wanna check out those videos as we wrap up our complete study of how to find limits using algebraic techniques. Check them out. We'll see you next time.